Today is April 24th. This is the Art 101A class, and we're going to be looking at the artwork in the United States following World War II. Uh, anyone remember anything that I said last class about the United States after World War II? What happens after World War II? How does the United States uh, fare after World War II? Here's a little hint. America turns into the powerhouse. Yes, this, uh, that's, I think the, the word they use is a superpower. So it's sort of like a, a, it's more than just a country and it's not quite an empire. And if you think about it, uh, there's, have you heard the term, the arsenal of democracy? No. So an arsenal is the place where weapons or who, that produces weapons, where weapons are kept. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt during World War II has a famous uh, a famous comment or a famous, uh, uh, what, what do you want to call it, phrase, which is the United States is the arsenal of democracy, which, is, which means we are the country that arms democracies to defend themselves against tyranny and totalitarianism. And that's really sort of the, the moniker of the United States after World War II. We force England to get rid of her colonies. And eventually you could say we sort of stand up to the Soviet Union and force them to give up their control over the Eastern European bloc. And of course, the United States has a very messy history in Latin America and other parts of the world in its effort against the Soviet Union. But back home, definitely the United States is the cultural powerhouse, mainly because or partly because there's no Europe, no culture alive in Europe uh, for a decade or so after World War II because people are devastated by war. Fortunately, the United States didn't have war come to the home front. And so the United States really is the only player on the world stage following World War II. Here you can see them lifting the flag up above, I think this is Iwo Jima. And it's a pretty dramatic photo. And I believe this was turned into a sculpture um, somewhere in the United States. It's a very famous image. And you can see how photography captures a sort of the story of the war. And we've looked a lot at a lot of photography and how it captures uh, it captured history in the 1940s, especially sports, Hitler. Um, I think we focused mainly on that. And we looked a little bit at Norman Rockwell um, last, last class. So today we're going to look at another, the, the more sort of high, high art side of, of culture in the United States following World War II and the likes of the pop artists and the abstract expressionist artists who uh, emerged in the 1950s. And one of the things that creates the abstract expressionist movement in the United States is the arrival of European immigrants who are fleeing the likes of Hitler and the Holocaust. So you have a lot, you have a big influx of artists from Europe, uh, not unlike what we talked about when Constantinople fell and the Greeks fled Constantinople and went to Rome. Of course, this is back in 315 AD. Um, wait, when did Constantinople fall? Wait a second, sorry, 1452. Ooh, big mistake there. 1452, uh, 1453, or the Harlem Renaissance when a lot of former slaves in the United States went to Harlem uh, seeking work and seeking sort of liberation and livelihood and pollinated Harlem with a lot of cultural, um, the culture, with a lot of culture. And I think the same thing you could say happens in the United States after the 1950s, or in the 1950s after World War II with a lot of European immigrants pollinating the United States with a lot of new ideas, including what we saw a few weeks ago or the beginnings of which were a few weeks ago in the class, which is abstract art. Um, and so we're gonna see a lot of abstract art today or some abstract art, but it's sort of the American twist on abstract art. And again, it's really due to the influence of European immigrants who, for instance, uh, became teachers at some of the major American colleges like Black Mountain, in North Carolina. And you might have some trouble appreciating this artwork. A lot of people do. You'll often hear people say things like, my kids can make that. I'll jump in a little head here. About things like this, for instance. And I'll try to help navigate with you guys through that sort of um, the challenge of appreciating this artwork. But let's look at it at least in terms of the roots of this artwork first. Um, so here we are looking at the roots of abstract expressionism in the United States. And really, most people, most art historians would definitely agree that Picasso, Pablo Picasso, is the major 
patriarch or the major sort of luminary in the 19, uh, 1900s, hovering over the minds and the, the sort of artistic sensibilities of the artist in the 1900s, similar to perhaps the way Beethoven dominated the symphonic musical world for over a decade, having sort of defined the musical vocabulary for everyone. Pablo Picasso very much was sort of a definitive um, artist in the 1900s. You saw Guernica, you saw his sort of blending of, ab of abstract and representational art. And here we'll briefly take a look at another one of his paintings, just so you can get a sense of how he sort of influenced American artists and his visual vocabulary. So uh, Ali, we were talking a moment ago, so let's keep talking now. What are we looking at here? Can you see this picture? Yeah, I can see it. So what do you think, what is this picture all about? It looks like two people hugging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I remember correctly, we're not gonna spend too much time on this. I think it's a woman looking into a mirror and Picasso plays with the sort of dichotomy with the sort of binary opposites of sort of the two sides of people's personalities, the two sides of the self, very much related to Sigmund Freud's analysis of the ego and, and sort of pop parapsychology, or you could say pop psychology, um, related to the sort of subconscious and the conscious mind. The subconscious mind would be the, the mind of dreams, the uncontrollable sort of well of, of desires that we all have versus the conscious mind, which is sort of filtering all that information constantly. And so that really becomes a major part of, um, of artwork in the 1900s with artists tackling the sort of nature of the self, the ego, and visualizing it in this sort of, in terms that are spitting for, um, for the era. And I think the abstract art of the 1900s is turned to addressing the sort of self, especially here in the case of Picasso, where I think he's looking at a woman or addressing a woman looking into a mirror as a sort of uh, person reflecting on the nature of the conscious versus the subconscious. Um, so there's still very much a, a relationship to the real world here, but it definitely straddles the line between the, the realistic or the representational and the abstract. So we still very much have a, our foot firmly in the real world, as it were, um, with one foot definitely in another dreamlike world. And that has something to do with what they call surrealism. Uh, and we'll see a little bit of Salvador Dali in a moment, another Spanish artist, by the way. And he has a wonderful museum in St. Petersburg. So when the pandemic's over, assuming we don't all, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> when the pandemic's over, you should definitely go pay a visit to the Dali Museum. We'll get back to him in a moment. So remember, Pica Pablo Picasso is a major artist of the 1900s and many artists following his in his sort of legacy or, or have to struggle with how to sort of get past Picasso in order to reinvent art again. And here is another example of art. Um, it might look like Picasso, but in fact, it just shows Picasso's influence on a Cuban artist who was his protege. And you could see this sort of Picasso-like um, reinvention of space and figures uh, and so that it's sort of a blend between or a hybrid between abstract and representational. In this case, with the tropical colors fitting uh, for Cubic, Cuban subject matter. And this is a really wonderful Cuban artist um, who's got the sort of unique Cuban twist on art as many Cuban artists uh, are famous for having. In fact, Cuban artists are pretty unique because they had a lot of uh, support from the Cuban government during the revolution. So it's a very interesting subject matter to explore in the future if you guys wanna uh, explore that. I highly recommend taking a look at Cuban art. And you can see the Picasso influence on him, maybe in the, the face on the left, the sort of use of masks and playing with abstract and representational subject matter. Of course, on the left, it's a lot more of a, um, uh, terrifying subject or a lot more uh, emotional subject perhaps with war being the focus where on the right it seems much more about music and, and nat the natural world and, and maybe tribes, some kind of a fusion of Af the African influence in Cuba where there were a lot of slaves with the sort of a Picasso influence. And again, Picasso was a mentor of Wilfredo Lam. And here we get to the United States as I mentioned, 
European immigrants come from Europe fleeing Hitler. Uh, a lot of them were Jewish, so you can understand why they were leaving Europe. And they have a profound influence on American art, including Willem de Kooning, whose artwork here definitely sort of shows that sort of Picasso blend of abstract and representational. And representational is another way of kind of saying naturalism, some representing the world. So uh, Ryan Plensis, are you there, Ryan? How about uh, Paulina? Pa yeah. Okay, we got Ryan here. Ryan, which of these pictures is more unflattering of, of the women, in the one on the right or the one on the left? Definitely the one on the right. Right, so, and there's no, I, I don't think he was trying to be flattering. Can we agree on that? Yeah. And I think you could understand this painting perhaps in the wake of war. It probably would be really hard for an artist to uh, keep painting the way he or she did after war. Um, yeah. And I think Mark Rothko famously said, after World War, he is an artist, American artist. We won't look at his work, but his quote is all I'm gonna tell you about. He said, you know, after World War II, you, he couldn't paint figures without mutilating them. And I think that quote just testifies to how war changes the way people think about things, including, you know, like might think about a pandemic, but a war is I think another degree, another order of magnitude of horror. And I think one way of understanding this artwork we're gonna see is thinking about how war causes people to question institutions and question things that, that came before. And so part of this, I think, is sort of the deconstruction of all the visual vocabulary that, that existed before World War II in, in search of a new sort of language fitting for the post-war World War II era. And also, I think the Kooning is really trying to take what he had in Europe, and he is in the European immigrant, by the way, he's I believe from Germany, I'm not sure about that. And he's sort of wrestling with the European vocabulary, but retooling it for an American experience. And I think it's pretty clear the, the influence of Picasso, which is here on the left, on figures on the right, whether it's in terms of sort of deconstructing the, the female figure and sort of distorting it and mangling it and uh, making it very unflattering or just blending abstract and representational. But what I really want you guys to try to notice today is what it is particularly about American art that transforms the abstract art from Europe. And I will sort of help you answer that, but I want you to take a look at it first. But remember, think about things like how color, movement, lines, composition, uh, what role they play in the absence of naturalism, in the absence of representational art, which is to say, when you get rid of the sort of the real world basis for the subject matter we see, other tools move up in order to sort of provide some kind of, if not meaning, some kind of visual engagement with you. So even though what we're gonna see might be very seemingly random or weird or absolutely without any basis in reality, I would suggest that one way of appreciating it is to take what you've learned about color and composition, maybe movement, and appreciate these artists' work in those terms alone, which is to say movement for movement's sake, color for color's sake. Um, and keep in mind, this kind of interest in reinventing artwork for, in, for formal sake, or, or the form of artwork, um, treating artwork as sub, a celebration of form for form's sake is something we see in a lot of other artwork in this era because it all is connected to this postmodern kind of art expression. And I'll define that in a moment. And what you see, for instance, is in other art forms like dance is a rejection of, of choreography and an emphasis on improvisation. So that would be an analogy to this where they've rejected naturalism and representational subject matter in favor of pure abstraction, pure form. And that's something you'll see in all the arts after World War II, mainly because it's all part of the same era of deconstructing all the institutions, challenging the old language, the old visual vocabulary, and rejecting the whole idea of artistic genius or, or artistic uh, originality. And these are all really loaded terms, but even just that term originality, we've talked about the importance of of the printing press as a way of, of almost honoring or uh, giving autonomy to artists um, 
and, and celebrating their individuality, their individual expression. Um, and here, of course, it's still very individualized, uh, but I think you'll see that the artists are really sort of, will start rejecting the whole premise of, of, of authorship, of one needing to be sort of the creative genius and rather sort of relinquishing all of that. And it's sort of a confusing and baffling era. And we'll watch a video with a very uh, famous art historian who, who pretty much condemns postmodern art, but in a very refreshing way that I think you guys might uh, at least appreciate. So we'll get there in a moment. What we're looking at here is artwork from 1943. This is right before or maybe during World War II by Jackson Pollock. And he's a pretty major figure in the United States uh, because he is sort of wrestling with this European vocabulary. He is, um, which is to say, wrestling with abstraction. But as you know, abstract art can sort of blend the real world with abstract, but Jackson Pollock really pushes it to pure abstraction. And you can see here um, on the left how big this painting is. And that is one key feature of American abstract art in this abstract expressionist era. It's very big. And when I was in college studying art, and I was a pretty hardcore, I was an art minor in college, and I was definitely pretty hardcore. I really liked this work, and, and I really liked this era. And now I don't as much. But one thing I do remember really loving about it is the scale. Uh, I think one thing you guys should appreciate is that abstract art, when it's only like this big, is very precious and small, or, or the size of the artwork kind of limits. But when you make abstract art really big, what happens is you start noticing it becomes a recording of the human body's sort of movements as, as the artist makes artwork. And I think even here you could see the way the artist flung paint, threw paint, uh, tossed paint at the canvas. It's as much a recording of color and movement as it is the sort of dance of the artist as he moves around the canvas, which I think was on the ground. And there's something very free and um, almost dreamy about it. But I think what really I liked about it is the scale, because the scale really felt like you could have a lot of more fun and very liberating. And I think that scale is one of the key parts of postmodern art. Um, you take the sort of smaller canvas and make it really big, and it becomes almost like a sensory experience rather than a sort of window into a subject that you're looking at. And you could see what kinds of uh, what kinds of tools are the is the artist enlisting here, uh, Ryan? What formal tools would you say are used here? Color. Yeah, color. And anything else? I mean, I guess you could just say like what you said, the movement, but that's not really in the painting, but you can kind of see how he splattered the paint. Yeah, and so it's a, a sort of a weird twist on movement. It's not so much showing something moving, but rather showing how the art, the art moves or how the, the paint. And I think a lot of people will say, you know, my kid can do this. And, and I don't think that's necessarily a, an unfair comment. Um, as we'll see in a moment, uh, this art historian basically thinks, well, these artists have kind of painted themselves into obscurity because I think they're, they become out of touch with the typical sort of uh, art viewer, which is not a, necessarily a fair statement, but I think it's understandable why people might have a hard time putting this artwork into a meaningful place without having a lot of other baggage to ex help explain and triangulate meaning, like what I was saying about World War II, European immigrants, and sort of the influence of Pablo Picasso. But I think it's also fair to say that these American artists are trying to uh, step up to the plate after World War II and show that American artists are worthy of the, the title of being the art, the art of the world's superpower. And you could see here is another example, Ryan, what kinds of tools are at play here? Definitely color again, complimentary. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, and so good. Now you're noticing he's, you know, here it's sort of, I believe this painting, yeah, Lavender Mist, you can see these very kind of pretentious titles, right? Uh, so he's well aware that it's sort of like a misty kind of atmosphere, but without depth, right? There's no real depth. Um, and the same here, it's really color, movement, scale. And here he's playing, I think you said, I don't know if you said primary, but he's definitely playing with colors, unmixed, and you might think of it as layering. Um, but you know, you look at this and it's not like you're supposed to find like someone in it, you're not supposed to find subject matter. And if you did try to do that, you would kind of be missing the point. And I think the point here is to really appreciate this in terms of the scale. And you can't really see that here, but imagine this is 10 feet wide and 
eight feet tall and standing in front of it. And it's sort of a wow moment because it's so big and so weird and so perhaps uh, inexplainable, unex inexplicable because of what you know in the artwork that precedes this for the prior, during the prior centuries. Uh, it really is sort of out of place. And yet it does flow out of this European interest in abstract art, only they push it to almost the most extreme degree with scale and pure color and pure form. And it, remember, corresponds completely to what's going on after World War II, which is a challenge, a total challenging to all the institutions, traditions um, that came before. And here you can see Jackson Pollock, Pollock with his wife, who's also an artist, and we'll see her work. Um, and he painted the, the paintings by dripping paint. Um, one art critic notably called this artwork or his artwork uh, apocalyptic wallpaper which I thought was a I think is a great title because it refers to the specter of, of, of atomic weapons that are that's sort of hovering in the background in this era with people sort of afraid of World War III breaking out in any moment and again you could see him sort of dropping the paint dripping it and the art is sort of recording of, of, of his movement He's listening to jazz. He was a very big fan of jazz, and the music definitely inspires his painting. But what happens is, uh, well, well, we'll get there in a moment. So here you can see his wife here and Jackson Pollock. Um, a lot of his artwork here. You can see the scale of his artwork. He looks very much like James Dean, very much a, of his, a man of his era. And he has this Time Life magazine spread in which the Time magazine writer asks, and I think somewhat tongue in cheek, is he the greatest living painter in the United States? You could also read that as, is he really the greatest living painter in the United States? Like, is this really? And I think you could read it sort of somewhat tongue in cheek because I think a lot of people, when they saw this work, they, they did wonder like, what, huh? I don't get it. Especially when you think about Norman Rockwell, the work we saw the other day, this is, couldn't be as more opposite uh, in terms of no subject matter than what we saw uh, the other day. So. Here is uh, some artwork actually by his, I believe this is by Lee Krasner, his wife here on the right. Again, color, movement, um, and maybe some vague reference to form, but not quite. It really doesn't uh, sort of want to give you anything real and crisp. Uh, you know, 1957, so we're moving a little further. This is, you know, his wife's work. And you can see the scale. Here she is standing in front of this artwork. And the scale, the scale again, is really what I think is so impressive about this artwork. You, didn't, you wouldn't have seen any European artist working with this kind of scale. And I think when you look at the United States, um, McDonald's, you know, supersized me. When I was a kid, candy bars, the biggest candy bar you could get was like this big, right? What, kind, what do they call candy bars at now? Like king size, right? When you guys get a little older, they have emperor size candy bars. And my United States is all about big, right? SUVs, uh, big Super Bowl stadiums, uh, you know, air, big airports. Uh, big air uh, cruise liners and I think the artwork from the 1950s is trying to be big and bold as the United States really the, 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 which really reflected the personality of the United States after World War II being the superpower so I think these artists are really trying to sort of put the United States on the map and offer something that's somewhat related to the European artwork that came from Europe or the influence but also make it bigger, make it uniquely American. And that size is what makes it uniquely American. And again, you can see the scale here. This woman clearly is just walking right by it. And I think, you know, what is there to look at here except sort of to appreciate the movement, the sort of a uh, hazy atmosphere perhaps. And I think you also see the recording of the human body. It's almost like a dance with the, where the artist is, is applying paint, you know, not from the, the wrist with little fussy marks, but and not even from the elbow where you sort of, the body is, a, is really a tool to help apply paint to the canvas, but rather more from the shoulder where you're flinging artwork or you're flinging paint or moving, getting your whole body involved in creating this artwork. And I think a lot of artists, myself included, found it's really fun to sort of uh, explore the scale because it really gets your whole body involved and it becomes very less fussy and precious, it becomes more like a dance. And I think that's one way to appreciate this artwork. So, the other side of this era is Andy Warhol. Oh, by the way, let me add something. This guy, Jackson Pollock, he ends up committing suicide. And I think that's partly because he painted himself into a corner. He really ran out of 
interest in his own purpose in painting this kind of artwork because it sort of perhaps didn't quite crystallize into something more than just sort of him being a, a sort of novelty, which is I think what, what happens in this, this uh, magazine article. He sort of realizes he's sort of a, a joke and becomes a very, uh, becomes a, uh, succumbs to alcoholism. And Lee Krasner continues painting after his death, but Jackson Pollock kind of just becomes a, a, a major moment in history and that's it. And he wrestles with the Picasso sort of dilemma, the abstract uh, challenge posed by Picasso and achieves something unique and sort of paints himself to, into a corner and thus ends the story of Jackson Pollock. The other side of this era is the pop art world, which we see here with the likes of Lichtenstein and we'll see it with Andy Warhol. And I think this is probably the artwork you guys might connect to a little more, um, probably because I think it's, it's really artwork that relates to the technological influence on art and the uh, influence of mass media. And you can see that here, in fact. And let me uh, ask someone here, Paulina. Okay, are you there, Paulina? Yeah, I'm here. So here's a painting by Lori Lichtenstein. Um, do you see these little dots everywhere? Yeah. Where do, what are those? Do those re make any visual reference to anything we know in the world? I mean, they're kind of like the dark. They kind of make like contrast with all the white. Uh -huh. Where have you seen ever seen dots like that anywhere in the world? Like Does that re does that resemble anything? Let me see if I can find an example here. So when you look at, just take it. You can't. I don't know if you get close enough, but if you ever look at print material, like a picture on the newspaper, or anything printed in a magazine. If you look really up close, do you, do you see these little dots? Yeah. And so what are those, what, what are those dots basically there for? Like if you see a photograph in a newspaper, those dots are, are a way of sort of printing an, a photograph, right? Or, or an image. Yeah. Um, but how do they work in terms of, of generating kind of a picture here? You might think of, uh, the thing is, when you look at, at the picture in some arrows, you don't see the dots. You just see like the overall, the overall colors and stuff. You don't see exactly like the dots like they're presented here. Right, right. Hold on, let me get some kind of chat from someone else. So yes, uh, not, yeah, that's actually a great point. Someone makes a point. AJ Rizzo made a point. There's a you know the Japanese flag, the land of the rising sun. Uh, the Japanese flag has the sun in the center. I think this could absolutely be a reference to that. Maybe substituting Japan as sort of the rising sun. Japan, of course, wanted to conquer the United States. And that's, how did that work out for them? Not so well. So maybe this is Lichtenstein making a subtle point that the United States is now the land of the rising sun. Of course, that means symbolically, culturally, we are the sort of new era of the sort of cultural, new cultural era. And uh, this point that you're making about the dots, yes, exactly. You could see... The, we're not supposed to necessarily look at the dots, but rather the dots blend together um, visually from afar. And I'll get back to these pictures in a moment. You can see here, uh, an example might be the pointillist painting of Surat, where he uses the little pointed dots so that our eye blends them together. The same way when you blend blue and uh, red, you get purple. If you put two dots next to each other, blue and red, you'll get purple and the eye blends the colors together. The artist doesn't blend them, your eye blends them. And the reason why you see that um, in these paintings is because these artists, we'll go back in a moment, these artists are taking um, a new source of inspiration from the world to make art. And what's the source of inspiration for this kind of artwork, um, Paulina? Where do they get this sort of from? Didn't they take it from like past paintings that you said, the one in the... Like, yeah, maybe Surat, but where, where, are they, where are they seeing this kind of dot form of, of color application? Isn't it like in the newspapers and stuff? Yeah, exactly, newspapers. So, you know, you think about traditionally, we think of artists sort of, oh, they're using paint in order to paint, you know, the landscape, the portrait. Well, these artists are saying, wait, hold on. I'm going to take the way newspapers print color, print ink, and I'm going to use that 
and make artwork the same way a newspaper makes artwork. And one key thing changes when you do that. What, hap what's, what's, what changes when an artist does this? What, or what's different between this and say a typical painting, like with a paintbrush? What changes? This painting doesn't have like a, the blending of colors as the others. Yes, yeah, so the artist is no longer blending the colors, right? Or at least not even sort of laying them on top. They're totally separated. And you yeah. might consider it's the difference between a machine making something with this sort of mechanical precision versus a human hand making something with, with zero precision, right? Yeah. And we saw that with Vincent van Gogh's work where the sort of the mark of the artist, like in Vincent van Gogh, is almost sort of imperfect and yet very relatable because we all know like when, when you look at handwriting, right? If I write something by hand, that is much more relatable as far as a human being's, it's, it's, a, it's an insight into the inner world of the human being who made the mark versus typing something, which is much more mechanical, right, Paulina? Yeah. So this would be the equivalent of almost typing versus writing. So this would be mechanical application of paint versus an artist applying it by hand. And the first thing you might consider is, well, when you do that, are you really still an artist and are you really still making art? And that ex is exactly what I think the artists are trying to get at, which is they're challenging the whole premise of art as, the, as something original or even as an, art, an artist as someone sort of exceptional or individual. They're almost mechanizing artwork, not necessarily because they think that's better or more fitting for the subject, but rather because it's a new way of looking at art that hasn't been seen before. And more importantly, and I think this is for me the most important part, they're making an artwork using a tool that's very relatable, if only because it's something we see every day. So they're taking from the world they see all around them all the time, print media, and they're bringing it into their artwork because it should connect to the world around them and the people looking at their artwork will connect it to, oh, that's like newsprint. And I think you'll see more of that as we see more of the pop artists because they're really basically saying, wait a second, let's take the pop art world and make artwork about it. So how does that relate to this one, uh, Paulina? What is this, is this pop, what is pop culture about this one? Is it like the style it's in with the words? There's... Well, is this like a pic, is this actually like a, is, does this look like a, it's a, a painting of World War II planes? Like, is it, no. it's, it's almost like a cartoon, right? Yeah. It's, and so he's taking a cartoon, which is something you see every day in a newspaper, right? Back in the day, you would open it up and you'd look at the family circus and peanuts and, and none of them would be very funny, but you'd like looking at them. And this is sort of the artist, probably even, and I think tackling sort of childhood, like take treating art as something maybe more, um, related to perhaps a child, like the child imagination, uh, taking something that's very familiar from pop culture and putting it on the wall, making it really big and saying, hey, why not treat this as art too? And when you look at this little comment up here, do you see the words saying, okay, hot shot, okay, I'm pouring. Yeah. So you could on one hand say, that, oh, that's a reference to him firing his weapons in the airplane, but others have said, well, that's probably him making fun of Jackson Pollock, who poured his paint on the canvas, like you saw in these pictures here, where he's you know literally pouring his paint, dropping paint. Well, this is sort of a, a, a spoof, a mockery of him with doing a mechanized painting, you know, with the dots and all that stuff, and sort of saying, oh yeah, well, I'm doing something different than you. So pop art and abstract expressionist art are sort of the two sides of the coins. Abstract expressionist art is very much like the sacred, the Apollonian, the very uh, sort of pure art as they thought it was. Whereas pop art is very vulgar and Dionysian, very sort of uh, from lowbrow and very much a challenge to what we've historically thought of as of art, which is sort of sacred and, and holy. And here artists are saying, oh no, no, let's, let's use everyday stuff, everyday subject matter, even comic strips make it really big and why not offer that as art? And I think it's up for you guys to decide the value merit or not, whether it has merit or not, but certainly it's very original and a certainly a reinvention of everything we've seen in the art world up to now. 
we're going to look at another painting that I might have to hang up and call you guys back because the clock's running out. Um, but how about this one? Uh, let me pick up someone else here. How about you, uh, Megan, are you there? Yes. So uh, can you read that caption for us? Maybe he became and couldn't leave the studio. Uh, I think it's m it's m maybe, right? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Okay, we're gonna, I'm going to hang up and call you guys right back. So check your email. We'll uh, pick up where we left off, Megan. Okay.